talk about the genes of Genesis and uh, all kinds of issues today. As you heard, I was a, an atheist most of my life. I was an evolutionist. And if anybody would have told me that I could believe in a God one day, I would have told them they were totally nuts. I was a very aggressive proselyter for the evolutionary faith. And in my lectures, I taught many, many students, medical students and science students. If somebody would dare oppose the idea that evolution was the way in which things evolved and happened, I would get very, very aggressive. So I don't want to go that route. I don't want to be aggressive towards evolutionists because I was one myself and I know how I was thinking. And... Uh, some of these people are pretty bright people in the world, so there must be something in it that's exciting. And why is it that I no longer believe in evolution? It depends on your perspective. It depends which way you look at things. And if we can come to a conclusion that there are other ways of looking at things, well, then we don't have to fight and argue about it. This is the young man Charles Darwin at the time that he accepted the position as naturalist on the HMS Beagle. And uh, he was a young man. He was versed in theology. He was a naturalist. He was a bright young man. And uh, he, he undertook this trip. And as he was traveling on this boat to map many parts of the world, including South America, he took with him a book by Charles Lyell, Principles of Geology, in which for the first time were expounded ways and means how things came into existence in geological terms over millions and millions of years. So the idea of long time frames was planted in his mind. Now, he was quite a gentle guy, so they say. And uh, this man over here, this is from the British Museum of Natural History, is Huxley, and if you look at their countenances, you can see this is a stern fellow. He took no nonsense, and he was known as Darwin's bulldog. And he's the one who took on the theological world, and he's the one who flattened Bishop Wilberforce in his debate. Funnily enough, he didn't win the debate on the grounds of science. He won the debate on the grounds of attitude. Isn't that interesting? So we have to be careful how we present things. Well, this is how he traveled around the world, Charles Darwin. And it was here at the Galapagos Islands that he made an interesting discovery. And this is what we have to look at. What influenced this young man's mind so that he could have such an impact on the world? Well, one of the things he saw, there were many things that he saw, but one of the things he saw was this bunch of finches. And they were all slightly different. And you had small finches with sharp little beaks, and you had finches with very powerful beaks, and some of them could break open seeds, some of them would eat cactus, some of them would eat insects, some with a very sharp little beaks could go in between the cracks of bark. So they had different niches, different activities and different anatomies. Now this was very strange, because on the mainland, it's the songbirds that show this type of variety. And here on the Galapagos Islands, it was the finches, which do not show this type of variety on the mainland. And so Darwin looked at them and he figured, well, isn't it possible that they came from a common ancestor, and that somehow some finches had arrived on the island, and that over time they had changed? And this is how the idea of change through natural selection came into existence. Now, it's very logical. It's very visual. You can see it. And so the probability is 100% that all of these probably were derived from 
a few finches, or maybe even one pair. So isn't that evolution? Well, it looks like it, and in the textbooks it's depicted like it, but is it? That is the question we have to ask ourselves. Is there another way of looking at it? Now, Charles Darwin knew nothing about genetics. The science of genetics hadn't been invented. Well, it had. Mendel had done some work, but uh, it was in some dust-filled room in some monastery. But genetics is a totally different ball game as far as this theory is concerned. Today we know that the character traits that make us what we are, what we look like, are all encoded in the DNA molecule, in the sequence in which the nucleotides occur in that molecule. It's much like the letters in a page of writing. The sequence of the letters determines what the story is. So here we have exactly the same thing. So these bases, adenine and guanine and cytosine and uracil and all of these that occur in DNA and RNA occur in a particular sequence and the sequence is important. Now the problem is this. Natural selection can only select something that is already there. If I want to know which one is better than the other one, then I must have two things, one better than the other one, right or wrong? So natural selection doesn't answer the question, where did the thing come from? It only addresses the question, which one is more fit than the other and can be selected to produce offspring? It doesn't answer the question where they come from. So where does the actual DNA molecule, which is just information and nothing really substantive, where does that come from? Well, science has to admit that it comes about by chance, random activities. So they speculate there was an ancient sea, it was full of molecules, and over time, random reactions created this sequence by chance. Now what's the probability of just one little gene coming into existence by chance? So we need to talk a little bit about numbers. Well, I use this example because it's simple and graphic. If I had a pile of wood and I put a bomb under it and I make it explode, boom! What's the probability that the pieces of wood will fall into place to form a perfectly functional house. <laughs> well, if you work it out, it's probably 1 to 10 to the power of 80. Now that's the number of particles that you'll find in the entire universe. If somebody asked you how many atoms in the entire universe, and then broke it down into particles, electrons, protons, hadrons, quarks, all of those, in the entire universe, you'd have about 10 to the power of 80. So it looks so small, that figure, but in actual fact, it's a very huge, humongous figure. Now the probability of just one gene coming into existence, a small gene, coding, let's say, for a hundred amino acids. Your hemoglobin has over 600 amino acids. So a small one would be many, many millions of times greater than even this. So the probability of it happening is virtually non-existent. Now scientists know this, and so in order to get it to work, they have to have a lot of time for these random activities to happen. But it can't just happen once, it must happen many times. So the genes that we have are called our genotype. And that which they express is the phenotype. So when you're looking around, what do you see in your neighbor? His genotype or his phenotype? You see his phenotype. Aha, that's what you look like. That's the phenotype. Now, in evolutionary terms, at the level of the gene, everything happens by chance. So if I want to change anything, I have to have a mutation, and that has to happen by chance. 
and it has to be, or do I say chance? Whatever, who cares? <laughs> it has to happen randomly. And then it must be expressed, and only if it is expressed, then it becomes the phenotype. Now natural selection operates at the level of the phenotype. In other words, that something must be there, then it can work. A simple example that I can use is two people, one thin, one... Is it a nice word to say? No, it's not a nice word. I'll say rotund. That's better. <laughs> one lean and mean and one rotund. And they're walking in Yellowstone National Park. And a bear comes up out of the woodwork and attacks them. And they take off like greased lightning. Which one is likely to be the meal? <laughs> the rotund one. So natural selection has selected the lean mean one and discarded the rotund one. You get it? So natural selection works at the level of the phenotype. So the genes, that's just the information that you have, and the expression thereof is the phenotype. Everything here happens by chance. And whether it is successful or not will only be determined once it's expressed in the phenotype. Now let's make this simple. Let's take a situation where we have a book containing all the instructions as to how to build this aeroplane. Now, that's exactly the same thing. The information in itself in the book does not produce the aeroplane. There has to be a process, is this right? So now the first question is, if this is exactly the same, and the information, the book that has been written, represents the genotype, then how did this book come into existence, according to science? By chance. By chance. So my question is, who wrote the book? Mr. Chance, you've got it. <laughs> Mr. Chance wrote the book. Because remember, there's nothing there. These are random processes. There's no person or anybody who can write this. This is a chance process. So here is the book. Somebody got a book for me? I'd like to have a book. Here's a book. That's a good book. Can I have that book for a while? Excellent. This is the best book in the world. All right. Here is the book. Let us assume that the information for the aeroplane came about by chance and it's all recorded in this book. Now, I will put the book down here. In actual fact, the information is recorded in here, but shh, shh. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. I'll put the book down there. We have all the information. That's great. Now, all I have to do is wait for the aeroplane to appear. What is the probability of the aeroplane appearing if I have all the information? Zero. You're right. The probability is zero. So what must happen if I want to transcribe the information in this book into an aeroplane? I must have some mechanism, firstly, to read the information. Isn't that right? So I need a reader. Where's he going to come from? Chance. You're right. He has to come about by chance. Boom! Little house. I have a reader. Now that's great. If I had somebody to read the information, that would solve the problem. The airplane would appear, right? No. So it's not enough to read. What must I have? I must have someone to take the information and to transcribe it and then I must have a whole factory in order to produce this thing. And then only when it's there, well, I know if it flies. Is that right? So natural selection only comes into operation once it's there. You can have your good book back. Thank you. Now let's see how that works. In the cell, 
we have the information here in the DNA. It's there in letters that have supposedly been put into an arrangement by this magnificent being called chance. Now in order to use the information, I must transcribe it. That means I open the page, I make a copy, like a Xerox copy, a photocopy, I send it outside to my factory assembly plant, there I have a fa factory, where's the factory come from? It has to come about by chance, by chance. Then I put the piece of paper with the information into my machine, it reads it, and there's a machine which transcribes it into the physical object. Wow! This is magnificent. Let's have a look at it. With computer animation, we can enter the cell to view this remarkable system at work. After entering the heart of the cell, we see the tightly wound strands of DNA, storehouses for the instructions necessary to build every protein in an organism. In a process known as transcription, a molecular machine first unwinds a section of the DNA helix to expose the genetic instructions needed to assemble a specific protein molecule. Another machine then copies these instructions to form a molecule known as messenger RNA. When transcription is complete, the slender RNA strand carries the genetic information through the nuclear pore complex, the gatekeeper for traffic in and out of the cell nucleus. The messenger RNA strand is directed to a two-part molecular factory called a ribosome. After attaching itself securely, the process of translation begins. Inside the ribosome, a molecular assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids. These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell and then linked into chains often hundreds of units long. Their sequential arrangement determines the type of protein manufactured. When the chain is finished, it is moved from the ribosome to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape critical to its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is then released and shepherded by another molecular machine to the exact location where it is needed. So it's a rather complex process with all of these enzymes producing this protein in the end, which by itself can do absolutely nothing. So this has to happen hundreds of thousands of times to produce all the processes and proteins that we need to be alive. So how did it all happen? By chance. Now you can believe that if you want to, that's your perfect right. But there's an alternative. It could have come into existence by design. So we have a choice now between the God of chance and the God of design. And now we must determine whether the probabilities of it happening favor the one or the other. Of course, we have another problem. Where did God come from? 
You see, we could argue there, chance or design, right? But the Bible says he's self-existent, he has always existed. So that is something that we cannot understand. So science and religion come to the same impasse. We don't know where the first thing came from, and we don't know where God came from. The Bible says he always existed. Science will have to say whatever created the material had to always exist because it's here now. So it's exactly the same argument. The one doesn't have an advantage over the other. Is there anything else that can swing the favor inside to one or the other? Well, there is. That good book that I had here has prophecy in it, telling history in advance. Now that is something that is very, very, very unique. And uh, we can talk about that at a later stage. But this is highly, highly complex. There are some things in science that are so complicated and they will only function once they are complete. So there can be no selection along the way. They cannot improve incrementally. It either works or it doesn't. We call that irreducible complexity. So something like the kidney that concentrates urine, the nephron unit inside it, it has to be complete. It is incredibly complex with channels that open, channels that close, enzymatic activities that carry things across. It is mind-boggling. And yet the whole thing had to come about by chance because it cannot be improved over time. It either works or it doesn't. Now science says if you want to change something you have to mutate it. That's like changing the letters in the book. So the nucleotides are arranged in a particular sequence. They work in groups of three. We don't want to have a science class so we'll make it very simple. If you remove a letter it has a very profound influence. An easy example is the cat and the hat. The enzyme reads it in groups of three if I delete the C, then it will read the at to the hundred to the at. So the mutated gene usually is useless. It is nonsense. It makes no more sense. And so mutations are generally bad. Now in order for evolution to work, you must have a good mutation, a positive mutation. And if you look at the textbooks, and you try to find them, they'll have an example. They'll tell you, for example, that sickle cell anemia is an example of a positive mutation. Now, sickle cell anemia is when your red blood cells, instead of being round, are like a sickle, like a sickle moon. And if they are in that shape, then the malaria parasite cannot enter them, and you're not inclined to get malaria. So that's a positive advance in terms of a malaria area. So the textbook says. Is it? Yes or no? No. no. If you've got sickle cell anemia, you're sick. <laughs> it's not a positive one. It's only positive relative to something else that's worse, malaria. But it's not a positive mutation. There is no positive mutation. It doesn't exist. So out of all of these negatives, we have to get a positive. So these are some of the problems. Here's another problem. If I have the first cell developed by chance, and it's swimming in the primeval ocean, blue, 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 and it's an amoeba or something like that, how do I get that single-celled creature to become multicellular with highly complex differentiated cells like muscle cells, nerve cells, epithelial cells, you name it, there's a muscle cell. Highly complex cell and there's a nerve cell and they're totally different. Now how did they come about? The genes coding for the one and the other are totally different. So in a muscle cell I must have genes which say you are a muscle cell and in a nerve cell, I must have genes which say you're a nerve cell. So the original little amoeba didn't have any of those. So where do all those genes come from? You have two possibilities. Chance or design. So for every time a new gene develops, it's what? 
boom, little house. Actually, it's boom, Empire State Building. It's far more complicated than that. When I have two kinds of cells in the body, then I get another problem. Then I have to develop a switch. A switch which says, Gene, you're switched on or you're switched off. So, for example, the nerve cell in my brain has all the information for every other cell in my body. Then how come it's a nerve cell and not every other cell in my body? Because all those other genes are switched off. Tick, 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 tick. Now that's very interesting. So there must be a switch. Where does the switch come from? Hello? You have two options. Chance or design? Boom, little house or not? So really, it's not just a question of something happening by chance once off and that's it. It is incredibly complicated. The most complex structures have to come about incrementally. Boom, little house. Boom, little house. Boom, little house. Boom, little house. Thousands of times over. How much faith do you need? You need a lot of faith. An incredible amount of faith. Now it gets worse. If I have two cells by chance developing, one having genes for muscle and one having genes for nerves, if the twain never speak to each other, of what value will they be? None. If my nerve doesn't tell my leg, lift up, nothing would happen, right? I would just be a dead piece of meat and a dead piece of brain. So I need genes to say, you are a nerve cell, you are a muscle cell. I need a gene which says you're switched on, you're switched off, and vice versa. I need genes controlling their physiology, I need genes controlling their embryology, and every single one of them, boom, little house, boom, little house, boom, little house. Darwin knew none of that. I think he would have had a problem. And now here is the mega problem. Every living organism, no matter what it is, whether it's a worm, whether it's a unicellular creature, or whether it's a bird, or whether it's a mammal, all of them have incredibly complex systems which make life possible. From the simplest to the most complex, they have, for example, a glycolysis system. From the simple to the most complex, they have a Krebs cycle. All of these complicated genetic components. Now, here's the problem. It takes thousands of these complex processes to make something alive. Very, very complicated. It cannot happen slowly over time. So if a mammal has it, and this echinoderm, the sea star, has it, and that worm over there has the same processes, and we want to say that these are more primitive than these, then we run into a problem. They all have the exact same complicated processes that make life what it is. So now, if they all have it, there are only two possibilities. As time went by, Independently, the same processes happen to evolve in each creature, or the more logical one, it was there from the beginning. Right or wrong? And if it was there from the beginning, then everything was incredibly complicated from the beginning, and boom, little house becomes a pale little scenario in this story. Now, here's another problem. Natural selection, the very word requires that there be two options. Isn't that right? I mean, if you're going to vote for the Democrats or the Republicans, you want those two parties to be there, right? What's the point of going to vote if only the Democrats are there? They're going to win whether you vote or not, right? So you have to have two parties. So everything that you think about has to be doubled up. So here is this powerhouse of the evolutionary process called natural selection 
and it's going to select the better of the two to the detriment of the not so fit and it's going to go extinct. Now, here's the classical textbook example, the peppered moth. It doesn't really exist like this. They actually pinned them onto black backgrounds, etc. You have a light one on a light background and a dark one on a light background. This one's visible. If you make the background dark, the white one's visible. So let's use this one. By natural selection, if birds feed on these, which one will survive? Oh, the black one will survive. And the white one will eventually become what? Extinct. Question. Has natural selection added something or taken something away? So 2 minus 1 is? 1. Here's my next question. If it's taken something away, then how does a process that makes less and less make more and more variety? Have you thought about that? So natural selection is a pretty useless creator because it cannot create anything. And once something is there by chance, the best it can do is to make less and less. Are the species on our planet disappearing at an alarming rate, yes or no? Which proves that natural selection is so good that soon there'll be nothing left. <laughs> now, if it keeps on taking away, then how did it do the reverse in the past? It's impossible. So let's have a look at some of these issues now. Let's say this is the dog rates. Every scientist knows this is one species. Whether it looks like a chihuahua or whether it looks like a Great Dane or whether it looks like a shepherd dog or whether it looks like a basset, they're one species. There's no arguing the fact. The question is, where did all of these creatures come from? They were bred from the wolf, right? Now, look at that. Does the wolf have ears like that? No. Does he have a color like that and a hair shape like that? No. By the way, does he look like a poodle? No. Does he look like this fluffy whatever? <laughs> yes or no? No. no. Alright, so here we have a problem. Do his ears represent any of these? Maybe close to that, yes. So all of these shapes and sizes must have been present in the wolf if this is what was bred out of it, right or wrong? So all of these genes must have been there but they must have been switched off, depressed. And the dominant ones that you see in the wolf are the only ones you see. But once you start analyzing, this is what you get. And for each one of these characteristics, there's a gene. Where did the gene come from? You have two choices. Chance or design. Chance or design. So either a designer put all of these alleles into the wild-type wolf, or chance put them there. And if it was chance, you'd have to believe, boom little house, boom little house, boom little house, with no use whatsoever. Because they're not even expressed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So let's have a look at uh, ladybirds. You get black ones, and you get the normal red and black ones. The one is a fall average, and the other one is a spring average. Originally they were two species, and then they discovered, no, under the one set of circumstances, one set of genes is activated, and under the other set of circumstances, another set of genes is activated. So it's the same species. In fact, all of these are probably one and the same kind. And whether they look like the one or look like the other is just a question of which gene set is activated or not. By the way, let's, let's take this a little bit further. If you had never seen insects in your life before and you came across a big fat caterpillar, would you say that was a butterfly? 
No, they don't even look alike, right? The one is a worm, and the other one is a beautiful butterfly. Are the genes for the butterfly in the caterpillar, yes or no? Yes. Must be. So, why doesn't it look like a butterfly if all the genes are there? Those genes are what? Deactivated in the butterfly or in the worm, depending on which one of the two it is at that phase. Isn't that right? Now imagine that in a broad sense. How much variety could you get in a kind? Anything from a caterpillar to a butterfly. That's an enormous variety. Anything from a chihuahua to a great dane. Now here's something other that's interesting. How do you get more variety? Now scientists know that natural selection is a useless producer of variety because it makes less and less. So they have to answer the question, where does all the variety come from? And the answer is, sexual reproduction does it, because it mixes the genes between two parties and that makes for more variety. But in order to get that, you must have the mechanisms for fertilization, you must have the mechanisms for meiosis, and they in themselves aren't anything, they're just things that happen at the level of the gene. So, male and female, where did it come from? Did it evolve, male and female, in order to produce new variety? No, now you're running ahead of Darwin. It's no longer evolution by natural selection. So somehow male and female had to come about by chance. With all the complexity that it entails at the genetic level, with the meiotic system and all those complex processes, mind-boggling. It came about by chance. The Bible says God created them male and Female. Which one came first? Don't you forget it, ladies. <laughs> the male came first. Genetically speaking, genetically speaking now, does Eve have what it takes to produce an Adam? No. Does Adam have what it takes to produce an Eve? Yes! Because we men have every gene that it takes to be a man or a woman. We have an X and a Y chromosome plus all the autos autosomes, right? Ladies, do you have a Y chromosome? No, so how can you produce a man? So the woman had to come from the man, scientifically speaking as well. There are many reminders that we have everything that it takes to be a woman. Breasts, for example, I have them. They're pretty useless in terms of, you know, feeding the offspring, <laughs> but I have them. So why do I have them? I have them because a woman needs them. Does that make sense? I have them because a woman needs them, and I can pass that equipment through the genetic process on to the offspring, and if she has the right hormones, then it will be activated in such a way that it will develop like it has to, to perform the function. But if I didn't have any, the woman would be in trouble. She wouldn't have any either. All right, so male and female came about by chance or design. That's the only possibility. The whole process of meiosis, where the chromosomes join up and... and uh, separate by random processes and then cross over information. Wow, now that's mind-boggling. You know, we can explain it nicely these days. If you have a computer program, a word processing program, and you've written a lot of paragraphs, today it is possible to highlight one of the paragraphs and click cut. Isn't that right? and then to go to a totally different page in my document and go click paste and then what has happened? My paragraph is now in a new position, is that right? Now that's what happens in your genes thousands of times over when you divide them up. We click and paste, 
cut and paste. So the blue one, let's say, is uh, dad's genes, and the red one is mom's genes, and so we cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste, until we have a total mix-up of the two. But I have to cut it very precisely. One little mistake, one little letter too far, and the enzyme would come along and read, and you wouldn't be a human being but a cabbage. <laughs> a precise process which does nothing but move paragraphs of information around. It doesn't produce anything, just changes the, the sequence. And then when it's read and made into the product, that's when natural selection takes over. So how did this complex process come into being originally? You have two options. Chance or design. Now you know what? As a scientist, I used to study this whole issue of the meiotic process and the crossing over. And it's so complicated that no scientist understands it completely to this day. But it had to come about by chance. And if it has one little mistake in it, then everything would be a cabbage. Wow! That is mind-boggling. So now, if we look at all those species out there, and we come across a fish like this that lives in a dark cave, or this one, and it doesn't have any eyes. It's called a cave fish. It lives in the dark. And scientists say, this is a new species. This ha evolved through evolution. It lost its eyes through evolution. It's a new species. Well, here's a blind cave crayfish. Here's a blind cave beetle. Here's a blind cave salamander and he has a blind cave cockroach. Did you know that cockroaches lose their eyes within eight months on the Hawaiian Islands when they penetrate the new cave systems of developing islands? Eight months, they have no eyes. Is that evolution or deactivating of a gene that is non-functional under that circumstance? What do you think it is? You switch them on and you switch them off. The stimulus of the light is gone. You don't need the eyes. Eventually the gene system is activated or deactivated as needed. That's not a new species. That's not new information. That's, if anything, less information, but I don't even believe that. I just believe it's deactivated information. So all of these wonderful kinds that we see out there, all of these creatures, are maybe just the result of differential activation and deactivation. You can get new forms by crossing them over. Here you have a cross between a lion and a tiger, it's called a liger. A cross between a dolphin and a whale, it's called a wolfen. A zebra and a horse, it's called a zorse. And a zebra and a donkey, it's called a zonkey. <laughs> now this is what can happen. You see, we have different chromosomes. Here's a long one, and there's a short chromosome, and if we fuse them together, then we get a long chromosome. Is there any new information there, yes or no? No. no. It's the exact same information. It's just in a different sequence. And what can happen? Well, here's a creature that has such a fusion. It's the largest antelope in the world. It's called the elants. And it has nice twirled horns and it has stripes on the side. There's another one, has the same fusion, twirled horns, stripes on the side. It's the kudu. You get a lesser and a greater kudu, two varieties. Here's the nyala. In fact, if you looked at the male and the female, you wouldn't even recognize them as one species. They're so different. Here's the female, so you can see the stripes nicely. Here's the male. Stripes are much finer. Twirled horn. There's the bongo. Stripes, twirled horn. There's one of the smaller antelopes, the sitatunga. Stripes, twirled horn. Question. All of these 
is the difference between them any greater than the, the difference between a chihuahua and a, a shepherd dog? No. So isn't it possible that they're all one kind? And if you want to believe in the story of an ark, then isn't it becoming plausible that the number of species that went in are a lot smaller than we actually imagine? Gets less and less? Here's a fascinating case. Here is the wolf. Now the wolf has 76 chromosomes. And uh, this is the variety that you find in the wolf. Now when you go to the jackals and the coyotes, they have fewer chromosomes, very often. Sometimes 38 chromosomes. Then they discovered that if they have only 38, then they're very long. And if it has 76, then it's very short chromosomes. So they did some mapping and found out, wow, it's the exact same information. They just fused together and then you get this magnificent variety. So now, if you look at the dog races, you will know that that is the same species as that. The small one is the same species as the big one. But when you come to the wild animals, they make them all different species. These are wild dogs. I would like to suggest they're all one. And the difference between them is just differential activation of gene systems. It's very interesting that the jackal, the fox, and the coyote can, under certain circumstances, interbreed quite freely. For example, the wolf will interbreed in Canada with a central coyote, which is large, but not with a coastal one that's smaller. But the central one will interbreed with a coastal one. So there's a link all the way through. And if we come to this in animal, then it's very, very fascinating. This is the dingo, and this is just a common garden hound. I don't want to be rude to it, but I just selected him because he looks exactly like a what? Dingo. Like a dingo. Now, if you go to Australia, the Australians are very proud of their dingo. Very proud of their dingo. And this dingo is protected wildlife. And it is an evolutionary phenomenon, this dingo. But the dingo is going extinct. Why is it going extinct? That's right. It's breeding with a dog. So with all respect, what is it? It's a dog. I'm sorry if there's an Australian in the audience, but it's a dog. Do you know that they even know that historically? They even know that the dingo was derived from Asian seafarers that came to Australia and their dogs got lost while their ships were in the harbor, which didn't exist at that stage. So it's a dog. It's got nothing to do with evolution. So all of these wonderful gene processes that we have, they came about by chance or by design. Transposons. When a gene can jump to another location and in one generation create a big rat or a small rat. So all of these magnificent genetic processes that Darwin knew nothing about, the built-in variation in the gene pool, the reproductive exchange, the meiotic process, the crossing over during meiosis, the recombination, the transposable genes, the rat drastic rearrangements, all of these he knew nothing about. Now, how did all of these complicated systems get into our gene pools? They either came about by chance or design. The choice is yours. I'm not going to make it for you, but if I were a modern-day Darwin, armed with this information, and I came to an island, and I found Loxops, this bird, and I saw all of this variety, would I say, aha! They all evolved by natural selection from a common ancestor, proving that there is no God. Or would I say, wow, what built-in variety in the gene pool? So let's have a look at old Darwin and his problem. If you look at the races of man, and uh, 
Adolf Hitler, for example, was a Darwinist. And he used his Darwinistic philosophy to say that one race was superior to another. And the same process has happened all over the world. In Australia, in the 1940s, you could get a license to hunt Aborigines on the basis, yes, the 1940s, that's not so long ago, right? On the basis that the one race was evolutionarily superior to the other. Now, when we see a poodle that has curly hair and black hair, do we think that it is genetically inferior to an Afghan that has long blonde hair? <laughs> no, it doesn't even come to mind. But when we see a black man that has black curly hair and we see a Swedish blonde, <laughs> are there some people that would note the fact that the one is genetically or whatever superior to the other, yes or no? Depending where you live, right? Depending where you live. So all of these races, where do they come from? What's the difference between a black skin and a white skin? The same colorant, the same pigment is present in both. The one is just more active, the gene, than the other one, right? So melanin is more produced in the one than in the other. There's no genetic difference, it's exactly the same. I put this up just to show the ladies that men are more handsome than women. <laughs> now let's look at these little children. Here is an Asian girl. And she has slanted eyes. Now that must be evolution, right? No. All that happens here is that the eyelid has more fat deposited in it during development than in a Caucasian. So both have fat, both have the genes to make that possible, but in the one it's more active than in the other. And that could just be a question of where it has been transposed to, to a position where the enzyme reads it more often. It's got nothing to do with evolution. So this whole question of creation and evolution and why do we have the processes that seem to point to evolution on this earth and on this planet is something that we have to look at in a different light. So let's look at this question of creation and possible restoration. We read in the Bible in Genesis and God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So here, everything was very good. I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yeah, I have made him. Isaiah 43, 6-7. So God says he created man for his glory, for God's glory. So you're not some afterthought. You're not some chance creature that evolved through a slimy process, you were created in the image of God for the glory of God. That's what the Bible says. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you it shall be for food. Now that's interesting. So what was the diet that was given to man? It was a total vegetarian diet, right? Now, in the evolutionary process, you must have death in order to propagate the more fit. Is that right? One dies and the other one is propagated. So the process of death is part and parcel of the evolutionary paradigm. So here, no creature ate another one. According to the Bible now, Everything was vegetarian. Because also to, what's it say there? Every beast of the earth, every bird of the air, everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I've given every green herb for food and it was so. 
So there was no animal that ate another animal on this planet at creation, according to the text, right or wrong? Okay. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day, and it was so. Genesis 1, 29 to 30. Now let's have a look at Darwin now. He saw the world. He's writing here to his friend, Dr. Arthur Gray, and he says, I am bewildered. I had no intention to write atheistically, but I own that I cannot see so plainly as others do and as I should wish to do evidence for design and beneficence on all sides of us. There seems to me too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the ichnomunidites, a category of parasites, with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars or that a cat should play with mice. Now here's death and mayhem and bloodshed. This is not what you would expect if there was a loving God. So David Darwin is looking at it like this and says, therefore, the biblical paradigm is wrong and the evolutionary one is the only one that makes sense. Let's see how he does it. This is his first draft or his first edition of The Origin of Species in 1844 and he writes, It is derogatory that the creator of countless universes should have made by individual acts of his will the myriads of creeping parasites and worms which since the earliest dawn of life have swarmed over the land and in the depth of the ocean. So if he looks at all these parasites feeding on other creatures and he says, it's rubbish to say God created. Doesn't make any sense. He says, but if we look at it from an evolutionary perspective, we cease to be astonished that a group of animals should have been transformed to lay their eggs in the bowels and flesh of other sensitive beings, that some animals should live by and delight in cruelty, that animals should be led away by false instincts, that annually there should be an incalculable waste of pollen, eggs, and immature beings. Evolution makes sense. Creation makes no sense. Now that's how Darwin saw it. But then, it depends which way you look at it. You see, there are always two angles that you can approach a thing. So let's have an open mind and approach it differently with the genetic knowledge that we now have. Now, if it's not perfect now, and it's not, then what changed? Something must have changed. Does the Bible give an answer? Sure. Yes, it does. We read in Genesis 3, 9, and God, Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? So here was a problem. They were hiding. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid. That's something new. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Because he was naked and he hid himself. So something changed. And the woman, what was the problem there? The man said, the woman thou gavest me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. It's her fault. <laughs> Nothing's changed. It's been like that ever since. <laughs> and the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, serpent's fault. <laughs> so the blame game came into the world. And then this interesting quote here. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. And above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly thou shalt go. So we assume it didn't go on the belly before. And dust shalt thou eat all the days of their life. Ha! They don't eat dust. What do the scientists say? But dust is an acronym for death. Dust thou art, and dust you shall be. So, acronym for death. Is the serpent associated with death, yes or no? Yes. And does it go on its belly? Yes. Now here we have lizards and snakes with remnant useless legs. Question. Do they have the genes for legs, yes or no? They must have or else they wouldn't have remnant legs. So what happened to those genes? They were deactivated and boom, they become like this. Ah, but they are different. They have fangs and they're poisonous. 
Now, did you know that the poison that comes out of there comes from a transformed salivary gland? It's just a salivary protein that is injected, and some of it is neurotoxic, and some of them is systemic toxic, but there's no new thing here. It's just a changed thing. What about a spider? Isn't that designed to kill? Well, some spiders eat pollen that is captured in their nets. So that could have been an original. Plus, again, the toxin is a transformed salivary gland. So it is injected into the product and then sucked out. It'll work on an animal, it'll work on a plant. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, so gentlemen, don't hearken unto the voice of thy wife, and as eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Here's something new. Now the ground is cursed. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth. So the ground is no longer capable of producing what it produced before. Now what is a thorn? A thorn is nothing other than a modified stem. There's no new genetic information. Some thorns, like on a cactus, are modified leaves. Now normally, when a leaf develops, the genetic system unwinds the leaf as it develops. Here, it just turns it the other way around. It becomes sharp, dries, and becomes a thorn. There's no new genetic information. This is not evolution. This is a transformation of existing gene systems. Here, on a rose, it's an epidermal or cortical outgrowth. There's no new information. The same with the thistle. It's the leaf petal that instead of unfurling, twirls around, dries, and becomes pointed and sharp. No new information. Now, Darwin looked at all the parasites and he said, evidence for evolution. No. Evidence for devolution. Let me tell you why. Here you have roundworms. Many of them are parasites. But many of them live freely out there in nature and are not parasites. So now if the ground is cursed and many of the environmental factors disappear that were there before, the animals have two choices. They either change their lifestyle or they die. So is it possible that some creatures change their lifestyles in order to survive? And because the original was no longer there, they became parasites. Did they evolve and become better, or did they devolve during the process? They devolved. The tapeworm, does it have a gut? Yes or no? No. Doesn't need one because it lives in your gut. You're doing it for it. So where did the gut go? Do the free living ones have guts? Yes. So this is interesting. What happened to the genes for gut? They were deactivated. That's what happened. There's no evolution here. This is not progress. This is regression. This shows that it was better in the past than it is now. There's no new information. Scientists will tell us that every year we get a different flu. That's evolution. The viruses are evolving, right? The bacteria are getting tougher. That's evolution. That's not evolution. This is the process. Here we have in the gene, we have something that is called a plasmid. That's a small DNA fragment that can be transferred from one bacterial cell to another. So it goes and it gets transferred and eventually it gets spliced into the new bacterium. So certain types of bacteria can donate a piece of their DNA to a recipient cell. The recombination is the same as sexual reproduction, but it's not new information, it's just taken from the one and transferred to the other. So there's no new DNA, it's just the old DNA. So acquired immunity, Resistance to pesticides, herbicides, resistance to antibiotics is never based on new genetic material. Just translocated material. Is it evolution? No. 
there is no evolution in any of these processes. Here's an interesting one, the mosquito. It has this proboscis with which it can drill into you. And, uh, you know, a mosquito is dangerous when it's quiet. You've noticed that, right? Once it goes, bzzz, it's still okay, but once it goes, bzzz, then you know you have a problem. And then it goes, bzzz, and it obviously has this thing designed to suck your blood. Did you know that only the female mosquito sucks blood? There must be a lesson in that somewhere. But the male, the male, what does he do with his proboscis? Well, sweet and gentle as the males are, he sucks plant juice. Plant juice. Now, what if the ground was cursed, no longer yields what it yielded before, and the plant juice just doesn't cut it to produce the eggs for the next generation. Could you augment your diet with the same equipment, yes or no? Sure you could. And what better than blood? All those nutrients and all those things. <laughs> so, was the proboscis designed to suck blood? Or could have it had another function in the past? Has a reminder been left behind to tell us what that function was? Yes, the male sucks plant juices. <laughs> so this is not evolution. And if we come to these nasty fellows with their stinging apparatus like the bees and all of these, well, that's just a transformed ovipositor. Nothing else. There's nothing new there. It's not evolution. And bees can lose it if they sting you. Question. A worker bee... Does it produce offspring? No. Does it have the potential to become a queen? Yes or no? What happens if the queen dies in a hive? They take a worker and they start feeding it royal jelly and what happens to the worker? It's transformed into a queen. Ah! So the genes that were deactivated and made it just a sexless little worker, are suddenly all activated, and here she goes, she's a queen. So there's a lesson in that too. Ladies, perhaps you all have the potential to be queens. <laughs> now let's go to the nitty gritty. I've been in so many lectures where scientists have said, now hang on a second, you've lost your marbles. Because a lion and a carnivore is designed to kill. He has all the apparatus. He's anatomically different. A carnivore has a shorter gut. His function is different. No way did that creature eat plants. You're off the wall. Now let's have a look at it. Here's a lion. He's got powerful jaws and powerful teeth. Surely he can kill. Now, the Russian scientist, Dmitry Balayev, worked with foxes. And within just eight generations, he would breed foxes that were totally mild, that wouldn't be carniv carnivorous by nature, but would sit around and be kind and gentle and whine if they wanted food and all of those things. So all the aggression was gone. So he analyzed it and he found that wow, the adrenal glands in just eight generations of selection had shrunk to half their size. The hormone serotonin in the brain had increased dramatically. And suddenly they were no longer aggressive but meek and mild. Did you know that schizophrenics have low serotonin levels in the brain? And did you know that certain of the foods that young people eat today and all of these snack foods with the antioxidants that are put on there today, lower serotonin levels. Is that possible? Why they become so aggressive? Why they don't pay attention like they did in the old days? Is it possible? Is it evolution? Well, let's have a look at this carnivore issue. Here's a bear. It's obviously a carnivore. There it's eating fish. 
But did you know that the bear is an opportunist and that over 86% of its diet consists of berries and grasses? And there he's grazing. And the fish he will eat after hibernation when there is no plant material around. And fortunately there's a salmon run. And the poor guy has to eat or starve. And so, is he designed to be that? Or is it designed to eat what he's eating over there? Now here's the panda bear. And what's its diet? Bamboo. What's it classified as? A carnivore. But it eats bamboo exclusively. The koala bear? Well, it's not really a classical bear, but it eats eucalyptus. Now, this sign, the scientists themselves put up at the zoo in Australia. And I, I was thrilled. I photographed it. So that's a photograph. It says, red pandas are classified as carnivores, meat eaters, but most of their diet is bamboo. <laughs> Does he have the equipment to kill, yes or no? No. He surely has it, but he doesn't kill with it. He eats bamboo with it. He can kill with it. Now the lion. He has the equipment to kill. What's the probability that the food source that it had available to it originally disappeared because of changes in the Earth's climate and in the ground's power to produce whatever it needed. And now the food that had to be cut with these scissor teeth. You know, if you eat something like cane, like the panda bear, you want to have cutting shears in your mouth. And these creatures have it. So they could have eaten tough plants that don't exist today anymore. The fossil record tells us that the variety of plants was far greater in the past than in the present. And these creatures that now have this aggressive look, but they're still beautiful, could have had a different diet. No doubt he has the equipment to kill. Now, here's an interesting point that I've noticed. The further away we go from the original diet, which was plants, the uglier they get. <laughs> it's just a fact. If you look at a little deer, everybody wants to cuddle a little deer, isn't that right? It's beautiful. And when you come to a carnivore, well, it's still pretty and it's still impressive, but it's got a look in its eyes that you say, whoa, whoa, right? And when you come to a scavenger, which is one further removed from the original, they get ugly. And the same with the birds. Here is a carnivore. It's impressive, but it's got a look in his eye, right? Yeah, he means business. And when he becomes a stack scavenger, he gets ugly. Now here's an interesting bird. This is the New Zealand key parrot. Now this parrot eats the roots of a particular tree. And in a certain area in New Zealand, they were developing an area, and they got rid of all the trees for the development. And the parrot didn't have any more food, so it had two choices. It either changes its lifestyle, or it dies. And so it changed its lifestyle. And guess what it ate? Sheep. It used to climb on the back of a sheep and with that beak rip open the back of the sheep and eat its way in to the kidney and eat the fat around the kidney. And the sheep were lying dead all over the place. Now if you want to get a New Zealand farmer angry, you kill his sheep. So quickly they replanted the trees that were the original diet and guess what? it stopped eating sheep. Now imagine that tree had somehow disappeared from the landscape for other reasons and some scientist came there and saw this vicious bird killing large animals over there and eating nothing but the fat around the kidney. Wow, he would have had an evolutionary story second to none and say, well this bird is equipped to kill. You can see the sharp beak and the talons, it's a murderer. 
Now this parrot hasn't got the equipment to kill. You can put your finger in a carrot cage. Pa- pa- I got that wrong, right? In a parrot cage. What could happen to your finger with those five tons of pressure in one bite? Yes, it would be very short-fingered. Here is a paku and there is a piranha. They belong to the same group. Some of them actually look very similar to this. And yet the one will eat meat and the other one will eat seeds. And what if there aren't enough seeds? Won't they vary their diet? Now, isn't it fascinating that creatures like chipmunks, you watch them on your television, even Walt Disney has them, Chip and Dale, right? What are they always collecting? Nuts and storing them. Now these days with acid rain and all the forest fires and all of these issues, these creatures are hard pressed to find enough food. So what are they eating these days as well? Road kills. They will start eating animals. Were they designed to do it, yes or no? No. Rodents are very interesting. They are coprophagues. That means they have to eat their own excreta to get enough energy out of the food they eat. Do you think they were designed to be coprophagues, to eat their own excreta? Does that sound good, very good? Not to me. All right. I got a lot of criticism for saying what I said because a lion, for example, has a shorter gut than a herbivore. So there are more changes than just the teeth. There must be something else. This is evolution, the scientists argued. And I said, no, it's not evolution, it's adaptation. And it doesn't have to take millions of years. And they said, no, you're wrong, it has to take millions of years. How are you going to get from a creature that has a 22 times trunk length gut, like any antelope or vegetarian creature, down to a six times trunk length. And I had a graduate student working on the PhD at that stage, working on antibiotic resistance, and we were working in chickens, and we were feeding the chickens plant protein, and then, like industry does, animal protein to boost the growth rate. And because she was feeding some of them with animal protein, and some of them with plant protein, and some of them with antibiotics, and etc. The idea came to me, I have the perfect opportunity to test this. So I went to the student and I said, I want you to do something. When you finish your experiment, I want you to measure every single parameter in the animals because I want to see if there's a difference from the plant diet and the animal diet. And I want you to unravel the gut and to measure the length. She thought I was mad. Well, we did it. And this is the result. Carcass mass, A, is the chickens that were raised only on plant material. Maize, soy, etc. B, only plant material plus antibiotics. C, animal protein added to the diet. And animal protein plus antibiotics. There was no difference in the growth, statistically speaking. But when it came to gut mass, The one that had only the plant diet had the greatest mass and it went down. If we added meat or antibiotics, it went down, down. Gut length. One generation, just six weeks of development. If they had only plant material, they had the longest guts. If we added antibiotics, the gut got shorter. If we added animal protein, the gut got still shorter. If we added antibiotics to that, the gut got still shorter. Isn't that fascinating? One generation, not millions of years, six weeks. Now, this one was fascinating. Heart mass. When they got plant proteins or animal proteins, the hearts were relatively small. As soon as we added antibiotics, the hearts got bigger. They got enlarged hearts. Now, you know, this is how science works. I looked at this, and I said to myself, wow. So antibiotics produce enlarged hearts in chickens during the developmental phase. Is that possibly a reason why young children today are getting heart attacks when they never got them in the past? The rate of heart attack is increasing in the world dramatically amongst young people. 
Is it because we are living in an age of antibiotics that during the development they have this? So antibiotics should be used only when necessary and not as a, as a food supplement as some people use it. Liver mass. When we added antibiotics, the livers were enlarged. So not a good idea. But just one generation and these things happen. They say to me, we have carnivore remnants in us because we have canines too, right? And our gut is omnivore, so we must have meat. Well, that, because of the gut length. Well, we see that that's not an argument anymore. And this monkey is a total vegetarian, and boy, does he have canines. <laughs> so is this to kill? No, it's to impress the ladies. <laughs> It's a secondary sex characteristic. Here's another experiment we did. Sheep were developing skew legs. And the scientists wanted to know why these sheep had skew legs. And I said, they're being stall fed, and you're feeding them animal protein to boost their growth rate, and that is causing an osteoporotic activity. They're losing calcium from their bones because of it. And they said, rubbish. And I said, let's test it. So here are our sheep. Some of them are on a plant-based diet. So they've got 12% plant protein. That's like a sheep that eats grass and alfalfa and stuff like that. Then we added 3% animal protein to one group, 5%, 8%, and then to the last group we added 8% plant protein. So we had those two groups. What did we get? If we add animal protein, the limbs get skewer. Fascinating. So here's one that's plant-based diet, nice and firm, and sturdy sheep. Here we're adding a little bit of animal protein, there we're adding more. This sheep can't even walk. Just the animal protein that was added. So if you look at it, the deformities that we have over here, fascinating. Bone calcium to phosphorus ratio, as we added the animal protein, so the calcium to phosphorus ratio dropped. They were losing calcium out of the bone. And if we looked at it, the top two groups, 20-20, the one just plant protein, the other one plus 8% animal protein, the calcium lost in the urine was more than double, almost four times the amount if they were on animal protein as opposed to plant protein. And the deformity was far more then double. And the calcium to phosphorus ratio was tremendously depressed if they were on animal protein. So it makes a difference what you eat. This is the perfect graph. Plant protein, perfect bone formation. 3% animal protein, worse. 5% animal protein, still worse. 8% animal protein, horrendous. 8% added plant protein, perfect. Isn't that fascinating? So plant proteins are good for you. And the same works for a dog. The same works for a cat. The same works for a lion. It doesn't matter whether they're vegetarian or whether they're carnivore. Fascinating. So what was the original diet of all of these creatures? Plant protein. Scientific evidence points to the fact that the Bible is right after all. Scientists will say vestigial organs point to evolution. No. What about the appendix? If you don't have an appendix in your developmental stage, you will not be able to distinguish good and bad bacteria in your gut. So it's an immunological function in your early development and you need it. Every single vestigial organ, whether it's the so-called gill slits, whether it's the so-called eye tympanic membrane, you name it. The list of these organs, since the German anatomist Wiederheim produced it, is rapidly shrinking to zero. Every single one, from the appendix to the coccyx to every single one, is found to be important. So, for example, the thymus originally was a vestigial organ proving evolution. Nonsense. It's important in the immune system. And so you can go through every single organ in the body. And there is no vestigial organ. Scientists will tell us 
We're related because of homology. Do you know that you have five digits on your hand, right? Now they say those five are the same as you find in all the other creatures in different combinations. So the horse has lost most, most of them and is walking on one toenail. That's what it's walking on. So, the primitive one is the pentadactyle, and then as we go through these animals, it gets transformed. Now, this is the fascinating thing. Notice this. Evolutionist biologist William Fix, now he's an evolutionist, he writes, the older textbooks on evolution make much of the idea of homology. Pointing out the obvious resemblance between skeletons of the limbs of different animals. Thus, the pentadactyle, five, limb pattern, is found in the arm of man, the wing of a bird, the flipper of a whale, and this is held to indicate their common origin. Now, if these various structures were transmitted by the same gene couples, varied from time to time by mutation, and acted upon by environmental selection, the theory would make good sense. Unfortunately, this is not the case. Homologous organs are now known to be produced by totally different gene complexes in different species. The concept of homology in terms of similar genes handed on from a common ancestor has broken down. What evidence is there for evolution? None. There is no evidence list. By the way, the most primitive is the five digits. The most advanced is just one digit left. Question. How come the most advanced creature on the planet has the most primitive hand? I'll tell you why. So you can play the piano. It's got nothing to do with evolution. Nothing whatsoever. So if we look at the world, and we look at it, from Darwin's point of view, and I look at the worms and the parasites and the death and the mayhem, I say there is no God. But if I want to believe in God, did God leave enough evidence for me to see that the world was once good, very good, yes or no? Yes, look at a flower. I mean, it is magnificent. God has left so many traces of his love, and his watch care and his beauty that anybody could look at it and come to the conclusion that once upon a time this planet was perfect with no death. If we look at the birds, they show plenty of evidence of this beauty. Do you know what this bird is? That's the sacred ibis. And it's beautiful in its colors. Now, there are other ibises, like these two. That's the common ibis, and this is the bald ibis. And he's no butte. And the only difference between them is a difference in their diet. That's it. Can this ugly old goat over here mate with the beautiful ibis? Sure, you know, the ugly guy often gets the beautiful girl. <laughs> and this is the offspring. He's no butte, but he's not as bad looking at his dad either. <laughs> so there is evidence of what it was like in the beginning. And we can either choose to believe God or to believe Darwin. That's our choice. We can look at the symmetry and ask ourselves how a symmetry of the gene system, which is bilateral, can produce this radial sym symmetry, which is mind-boggling, and say, wow, this is design. That's design. Now the Bible says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. Isaiah 65, 17. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. 2 Peter 3, 13. So both the Old and the New Testament say, There's a new world coming. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, for the creature has been made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same to hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. 
For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Darwin, pain, no God. Someone who believes, pain, consequence of sin. It's my choice, what I want to believe. Now this is fascinating. Isaiah says, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. So the lion is going to become a what again? A vegetarian. What was it in the beginning? A vegetarian. Where's it going? Uh, to be a vegetarian. Whether we like it or not, that's what the Bible says. And I believe there's enough evidence out there to say that God is telling the truth. And the cow and the bear shall feed, the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw, in other words, plant material, like the ox. It'll become a vegetarian. Far-fetched after this lecture, yes or no? No. No. But how many scientific minds out there have rejected God on the grounds of what they see without investigating whether God is telling the truth or not? And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the ass, so there'll be no more toxic snakes. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the cockatrice's den. They will play with these creatures. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, because the salivary gland will be a salivary gland. They shall not hurt nor destroy, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. Isaiah 11, 6 or 9. Now, I don't think this is what the text has in mind. <laughs> I don't think the serpent will look like that anymore. But the serpent, if it does exist still, will be beautiful again. And maybe it won't be there, I don't know, it doesn't say. But the fact of the matter is, if I have managed to give you the opportunity tonight to make a choice, Whereas before, perhaps that choice was not available because the media never supplies it. Then I will be grateful. And the choice is ours. Either God is a liar or he is not. Either he exists or he does not. And we have to look at all the evidence. And we are going to go now into different topics, prophetic topics, to show that God predicts precisely the future in historic continuum right until the end of time. Just as he here said, this is what it was like in the beginning, this is what it is like now, and this is what it's going to be like in the, in the end. So he does the same with history. And if the science doesn't convince us, like me, Science wouldn't convince me. I was an evolutionist and I was going to stay one until I was confronted with prophecy and I was driven in a corner. How do you explain this? The only solution is maybe there's a God after all. And if there is one, then what is the purpose of my being here? Is he a good God? Is he a bad God? How do I find out? So I invite you to come to the next lectures. Don't miss them. We're going to go into some thunderous events. Mankind is so deceived on every level that it is frightening. And we need to take cognizance of what says the Lord. Because maybe our very life depends on us. Thank you for coming and come again tomorrow night. God bless.